Good morning and welcome to the news on New Day Live from the John Hammond Street at Kanda here in Accra. And welcome to November 15, 2022. I am Judith Awache Tando. Coming up this morning. Patrons left the premiere of Galamsey Economy with mixed reactions with an expose that caused a finance minister to be sacked. Also coming up, public sector workers express joy over sale of foodstuff at the Agri Ministry at reduced prices. Plus, police secure injunction against Arise Ghana plant picketing at the Jubilee House on the current economic crisis. And on the international front, a 23-year-old Zambian student killed in Ukraine fighting for Russia. Details of these stories and more coming up in the next 20 minutes. Stay tuned. In our first story, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture has hinted of expending at vending points as well as adding a price to the food stuff that had been sold to government workers at the ministry. The ministry says that planting for food and jobs PFJ market at its premises comes at no cost to the ministry or government. According to the public relations officer of the ministry, the ministry is only facilitating the selling of the produce. This is not your regular day market. This is the PFJ market here, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. It is the two of this market set up right at the center of the ministry. But this one is going for 30 cities, one. The and when they have reduced it, you get it around 25 cities. It's very expensive. Yeah. But I was able to get this one for 10 cities. So is there a case where you think that the market women cheat us or you think it's, it's an I, I issue? Think of because I think there is no, the price control, the market women, they have an association. But I think what they are doing is something intentional. It's cheap. I don't know for how long it's going to take. In Ghana, we always look out for price. We want good things. Uh -huh, this thing. So getting it as compared to the market, I think it's better. And then in town, this one is a 15 city. It's Pona. And here is 5 city. I went to Tudu before coming here, so I am sure of the prices. Okay. And look at this. Obviously it's cheap. It's 10 cities. The bunch is 15 cities, so the two are 30 cities. Just last Friday, I bought three for five cities in Nansman. It's good that government is doing this to help us, but we also want to entreat him to extend it to other people in other regions so that they can also benefit. That is 10 cities, 10 cities. I think it's very good. Because comparing the prices here to the market, I think this one is far better. Comparing the economic crisis that we are in now, I think this is okay. Whatever is being the issue for the uh, market women, for their prices going up, they should try to work on that. Because as much as you sustain here, they are also working. That's their way of making money. So if you make this place very less, as you have made it, and we are all coming here, what happens to them? We were buying from them before this came. So if you sustain this, you should also make sure that whatever will help them to also reduce their price is done. Well, moving on, mixed reactions have greeted the latest expose by Anas Arimiao Anas, titled Galamse Economy. The corruption expose shows the now sacked Minister of State in charge of finance, Charles Edubwahin, receiving monies from supposed investors from the UAE. There's more in this report. The much-anticipated Galamse economy documentary was patronized by hundreds who thronged the Accra International Conference Center to catch a glimpse of the corruption expose. With high expectations, patrons were on the edge of their seats in anticipation. The about 45 minutes documentary, which was in three parts, began. Almost all of the over 1,000 attendees could not help but giggle at the sight of the president and the finance minister. 
Part one and two of the expose were centered on the president's campaign ahead of the 2016 elections. Number 12 expose and the death of a member of Tiger IPI, Ahmed Swali. The banking sector crisis in 2017 and conflict of interest allegations of Data Bank and Blackstar Brokerage, amongst others. Part three, the most anticipated, showed the engagement between Charles Edubohin and the supposed Sheikh, who represented an unnamed investor from the UAE. The Sheikh is heard in the documentary negotiating with Charles Edubohin over percentages and charges he will require to facilitate the supposed investments by the Sheikh and other business associates. In the video, Charles Dubois then mentions the need for the supposed business tycoons to see the vice president, Dr. Baumia, in order to facilitate their project, the establishment of a bank in the country. This is where the $200,000 was suggested by Mr. Charles Dubois as appearance fee for the vice president, amongst other claims of the involvement of the family of the vice president in some projects. Part 3 ends with Mr. Charles Dubois happily packing bundles of money into a black polythene bag he suggested he would use for shopping. Patrons share their views on the documentary. It's so sad I say so because you believe that people we have put in places of power would have the interest of this nation when they make certain decisions. And I say it's sad when I see an individual who forgets the role he's supposed to be playing for the general good and then becomes self-seeking and portrays such behaviors on camera. It's, it's really, really sad. The gentleman makes some categorical statements about the vice president. I think these are issues which the vice president needs to take personally. Well, I was say, <laughs> let me just say, I expect it so high. And in this case, it looks like the guy was just lured, in my opinion, yes, because he conducted himself um, as a decent guy. He spoke well. He didn't speak evil of anyone, like the other videos we've seen. And also, um, well, um, we know Arabs, you know, are kind, like, you know, they give gifts, so he didn't ask for anything. You know, this is, this is purely finance and an economic expose, and this, this expose clearly vindicates a lot of Ghanaians that indeed uh, the finance minister and his deputies must, be, must resign. Well, the sacking of the Minister of State at the Ministry of Finance, Charles Edouard, may have been expected, but not sooner than the conclusion of the ongoing IMF negotiations and the preparation of the 2023 budget as the President interceded on his behalf. But that intercession was only short-lived. While some say his sack was long overdue, the MPP members of Parliament, who have some time have been calling for his head, say it is welcoming. This report details what has cut short the stay of Mr. Edouard at the Ministry of Finance. But for the president's intervention, Charles Edouard Minister of State in charge of finance, and his former boss, Ken Uforiata, should have long been sacked. The president had asked the majority MPs in parliament who had called for their heads to allow them finish up with the ongoing IMF negotiations and prepare the 2023 budget statement. However, that life support failed the Harvard-trained banker, Charles Edubwahin. The president, Ekufuad, on November 14, terminated his appointment with immediate effect for allegations leveled against him in Anasa's latest expose, Galamse Economy. According to a statement signed by the director of communications at the presidency, Eugene Ahi, the matter has also been referred to the office of the special prosecutor. But what really are these allegations that have triggered the minister's immediate sack? 
a transcript of the excerpt of the documentary purports, the minister told an undercover agent of the Tiger IPI who posed as an investor desirous of doing banking business in Ghana that the vice president, Dr. Muhammad Baumia, is the go-to person for such deals. He is reported as adding the VIP would take 200,000 US dollars as an appearance fee. The Minister of State is also said to have demanded a 20% cut of the $500 million investment. The SAC Minister is also said to have suggested to the investors to buy government bonds, but the investors did not seem interested. Again, the Minister purportedly assured the investors he could bring the president on board the deal using his personal relations with the president whom he described as an uncle. The vice president, Dr. Muhammad Baumia, will not stand his name being dragged through the mud. He has since disassociated himself from the comments made by Dubwahin and called for his dismissal and investigation. It is not clear if the call of the vice president has anything to do with the minister's sacking, but private legal practitioner Martin Kebu, who has in the past accused Charles Edubwahin of conflict of interest, says the termination is long overdue. Spokesperson for the over 80 NPP MPs who initially called for the minister's heads, Andy Apiakubi says the sacking of Mr. Edubuahi comes as welcoming news and that they are looking forward to the sacking of Ken Oforiata as well. It is yet to be seen how the sacking of the minister would affect the ongoing IMF meetings and if the excuse of keeping him and his former boss for the deal by the president will be tenable after all. Let's do some politics now. And the Electoral Commission of Ghana has cancelled the certificates of 17 political parties who have no regional and national presence. The EC served the 17 political parties with a notice in early October and gave them up to Thursday, October 20, 2022, to show proof of why their registration should not be cancelled under the Political Parties Act of 2000, Act 574. The parties include the United Progressive Party party formed by Kumasi Bey's Akwesi Ade, popularly known as Odike. Another party on the list is the United Front Party, which is led by Ajeni Mboating, popularly known as Shataba. The Democratic Freedom Party, DFP, formed by Dr. Obeda Samwa, and the National Reform Party, led by Josie Tano, are equally part of the parties whose certificates have been revoked. Moving on, the Arise Ghana movement has rescheduled its planned November 15 picketing exercise at the Revolution Square in Accra. This follows an Accra High Court ruling upholding the application filed by the Ghana police to prevent the group's intended protest. Just Friday, whilst we are on, the police sent their bailiff looking for Arise Ghana and its leadership and eventually went to Rex Ousu Omari's house to go and locate him to serve him. And in that, they had gone to the court to demand or to request of the courts to place an injunction and virtually to stop us from carrying out with our event. The end, the court has ruled that we should do our three-day demonstration or picketing, but at the independent square. In view of the fact that we don't want our rights to be trampled upon, we fail to go to the independent square. As procedure requires, if you're not satisfied with the process or the outcome of the court, we, have, we reserve a right of appeal. So clear instructions have been given to our lawyers to immediately file an appeal and the stay of execution of the court orders. That being said, our willingness to demonstrate has never been affected and cannot be affected by this sort of interference and desperate attempts by the police. If nothing at all, we are ever strongly resolved to go out even more strongly 
to ensure that our voices are heard. Let's do some stories on the GJ Awards. In 2021, GJ Journalist of the Year, Portia Gabo, has been rewarded with a two-bedroom house with her employees and a media general group. Portia Gabo was a judge 2021 GJ Journalist of the Year. At a short ceremony on TV3's flagship news program, News 360, board chairman Koju Yanka presented her with a bouquet of flowers and announced the surprise package. In media general, we have a culture of recognizing. So it was important for me to come all over to come and say appreciation to you. But I have something more to tell you. I don't think Martin knows this. <laughs> On behalf of the board and management of Media General, we are going to present you with a two-bedroom house. Congrats, 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 congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but that's not all, Portia. We're also going to give you and your family a 10-day fully paid vacation to South Africa. <laughs> On this note, congratulations once again. And Thank all you. the best. Thank you. Thank you. May your effort inspire others. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I know. Thank you so much. Martin, I hand I am, you over. To, I hand I over am, to I, you. I am indeed humbled by this I gesture. Know. And it takes a village to raise a journalist. And I share in this with all those that worked along with me, my cameramen, management and staff of TV3. 15 years ago, as I stepped into this premises, I did not know that this day would come, but I took it one day at a time. And thank you all for helping me. And I am hoping to raise the next generation of journalists so that we continue to lift each other up. Thank you so much. Portia Gabo was on Saturday, November 12th, crowned the GGA Journalist of the Year at the 26th GGA Awards Night held at the Kempinski Gold Coast Hotel in Accra. She also went home as winner for the Best TV News Production and the Journalist of the Year for Health. Moving on, experts have described government's initiative of selling the Saglemi housing project to a private developer as long overdue. This comes after the Minister of Works and Housing announced government was exploring the possibility as it is unable to foot the bill for completion of the housing project. There's more in this report. Government has decided to explore the possibility of selling the Saglemi affordable housing project covering the 1,506 housing units at current value to a private sector entity to complete and sell the housing units to the public. Following this latest announcement by the Minister for Works and Housing, Francis Asensubwachi, the Saglemi housing project has been taken over by national security and we are not allowed to view the state of the premises. But let me take you back into history as how we got to this point. Since the procurement of a little over 2,000 acres of land during the era of President Kufour, the late President John Evans at Tamils on August 15, 2012, gave executive approval to the Ministry of Water, Resources, Works and Housing to implement the affordable housing project. Now, although the project was targeted at constructing 5,000 housing units, it was reduced to 1,506 housing units by the end of the stipulated completion date. Yet, 98% of project funds amounting to approximately 195 million US dollars had already been expended. Even so, none of the units were habitable due to lacks in basic amenities like electricity and water. Further technical investigations, however, revealed that the valued costs of work actually amounted to approximately 64 million US dollars. The remaining funds, well, the criminal prosecution at the High Court might reveal the discrepancies. According to the ministry, an additional 114 million US dollars would be needed to complete the project, which it does not intend to expend.
What makes the Sagalame Affordable Housing Project even more complicated is that government has expended approximately $196 million. And upon further consideration, government does not intend to expend additional taxpayers' money towards the completion of the project. But what effect will such a decision have on the final cost of the housing units to the public? Sami Amagaibo is executive secretary of the Ghana Real Estate Developers Association. For me, uh, the call from the minister or the ministry, I think it's in order. If you put the uh, money that has been sunk in, plus what is outstanding to complete the project, to bring it to, to usable uh, residential uh, space, then it means that we are probably not looking at affordable house at all. Judith Awachitando, TV3. Now on to the international front. A Zambian student who was imprisoned in Russia has been killed in Ukraine while fighting on the Russian side, an official from the Southern American country said. Now it's unclear how the 23-year-old who was serving a prison term ended up on the front lines. Nathan Nyirenda was studying nuclear engineering at the Moscow Engineering Physics Institute, according to a statement on Monday by Zambia's Minister on Foreign Affairs, Stanley Kakubo. Kakubo called on the Russian authorities to provide further details regarding the recruitment of Nyirenda and how he ended up fighting in Ukraine. According to Kakubo, Nyirenda was convicted and sentenced to nine years in here medium security facility on the outskirts of the Russian capital in April 2020. It remains unclear what charges Nurenda was convicted of. The Foreign Affairs Ministry said it received word of Nurenda's death on November 9 and that after communicating with the Zambian embassy in Moscow confirmed that the student had been killed on September 22. Now Russian uh, launched its invasion of Ukraine on February 24. And that's all for the news here on TV3.